Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hugo Gagioni. I am the CTO for Sony Professional Solutions Americas. And in the next half an hour, I'm going to give you some information regarding the use of HDR techniques for production and distribution applications. These are some of the topics that we'll be covering. Uh, first of all, what is high definition, what is high dynamic range? Uh, why is high dynamic range uh, creating so much interest in the industry at this moment? Also, we will be showing some uh, new terminologies that we have to begin using in, in when, when dealing with high dynamic range, such as OETF and EOTF. Also, some uh, introduction to the activities in standardization, what technologies are being proposed to the market. And I, I'm going to talk about a production technique employing S-Log3. It's a high dynamic range that we have for live production applications. And uh, I'm going to show you some workflows from high dynamic range and standard dynamic range. And uh, also the high dynamic range used here in the, in the, uh, in, at the show. OK, first of all, we need to define uh, how, how we quantify brightness. Brightness is quantified by the unit called candelas per meter square. However, that's a mouthful. Then most people use a term called nits. Therefore, we are looking at nits of brightness. This is the amount of luminance emitted or reflected by an object. And for example, my, a smartphone or a tablet may be about 200 nits of uh, brightness. In the shadows, in the dark areas, we may have one nit or over. Or below one nit of uh, shadow brightness. Uh, normal TVs, LCD TVs, are approximately 200 to 400 nits of brightness. And if we eventually go out to the parking lot and you, you look at the sun directly, we experience dramatic range of brightness, 1.6 billion nits. Now, the human visual system has a nonlinear characteristic. We don't perceive details in the highlights. We have a compression. This is a physiological uh, behavior. And uh, we don't have much definition in the highlight. However, we have a very detailed definition in the mid-tones and in the shadows. Therefore, uh, we require more dynamic range to be able to reproduce details, especially in the dark areas and in the mid-gray uh, areas of an image. Now, again, that chart illustrates the range of uh, brightness that we have in, in, in nature, from absolute darkness, zero nits, or 10 to the minus 6, all the way to at about 10 to the 9, 1.6 billion nits, if you were looking at the sun directly. The human eye also has a range of about 10 to 14, let's say 14 stops of dynamic range. But that on a stationary or adaptation mode. By closing and opening the iris, the eye is capable of adjusting to different levels of illumination. Therefore, altogether, the human visual system is probably around 24 stops of dynamic range, okay? Close to, uh, at a given instant, uh, at a given moment of adaptation, it's about 10,000 to one contrast ratio. The, well, the same thing happens with mechanical cameras. A state-of-the-art cinematographic cameras and studio cameras, we have approximately 14 to 15 stops of dynamic range, but at a given opening of the mechanical iris. By opening and closing the iris, we again reach approximately 24, 25 stops of dynamic range in mechanical cameras or electronic cinematographic cameras. The sensors of the electronic cameras, I'm actually illustrating the sensor that we have in our F65 uh, cinematographic camera. This sensor is an AK sensor, um, extremely low noise. And notice that the sensor captures light linearly. It simply it stops in the noise floor. And it has a saturation or a shoulder at the extreme levels of brightness. But the important point is that it is a linear capture of light. Now, 
if you capture this very large amount of dynamic range, 14, 15 stops, and we need to bring this into production, into my television station, in television stations, in production environment, we have 10 bits today. A few years ago, we had 8 bits. How do you put a gigantic dynamic range that usually it requires 16 bit into 10 bit of interfaces. Well, to do that, we've been using uh, knee controls in the studio cameras or gamma signals to fit it into the traditional ranges of television. Again, the sensors are linear. To place that gigantic dynamic range of 15 stops, we have to use something called ATF, acquisition transfer functions. And different vendors, different companies design uh, uh, this, this curve to physically match as best as possible the physics of their sensors. Then Sony has a curve called the s log 3, which matches perfectly the sensors that we have in our studio cameras and also in our cinematographic cameras. Therefore, the, the reason why we do this is to make sure that we don't lose any details in the highlights or the shadows or the texture of the information once we compress down to 10 bits for transmission. Once you have that signal, then you go into a production environment or a post-production environment, and the color grading process will decide, well, I want to exploit the details in the shadows. Therefore, you're go I'm going to grade that signal high. But by doing that, you may be clipping details in the highlights. Or otherwise, you may be able to, I want to expose details in the highlights. Then I'm going to compress or crush the details in the shadows. Therefore, this is the process of coloring or grading the signal once you are in the production or post-production environment. Then it appears that uh, there's a great chance that all of the signals that we are acquiring in our camera could end up perfectly matching the capabilities of my eyes because I have 24 stops in the cameras and I have 24 stops in my eye. The issue is that those signals have to go through cables, through satellites, through fiber, through a transmission channel. Then if my transmission channel has exactly the same bandwidth, the same dynamic range of 10,000 to one, great. I will be able to have high dynamic range capture in my production, in my living room. But that is not the case today. Today, and we have lived with this for many, many years, we only have about six to seven stops of dynamic range in transmission. Therefore, transmission is the bottleneck that's preventing living rooms and television set to see great high dynamic range pictures. OK, uh, I, it appears then the production community, the electronic community, is producing great, pic great cameras with uh, enormous dynamic range in acquisition. But it's the transmission path that's limiting to about 100 nits or 200 nits maximum during the transmission. Then uh, in the past, we never noticed because the TVs never had enough brightness. But what's happening is now that many manufacturers, and Sony began doing this about two years ago, we are introducing displays that can output 800, 1,000, 1,200 nits of brightness. Is it helping? Not really. Because what we are doing is just simply making it brighter, something that has been clipped during transmission. Therefore, that is the problem. We have to repair the transmission of those signals from acquisition to display in my home. And to do that, what we need is new display and acquisition curve, optical to electrical transfer functions in the content creation, and electrical to optical transfer functions in the display in my home. Well, that's one aspect. That's the dynamic range in the, in the luminance. The other aspect is the color gamut, the color volume. What you're seeing here is the actual range of colors that the inner triangle in yellow is the 709 color gamut that we have been using since 1992. 
is what we have in high definition. The black triangle is the recently approved, about six years ago, the 2020 color format or color recommendation, okay? recommendation 2020. But that is two dimensional representation. But if I combine that with brightness or luminance, now we have a volume of colors. That volume is the volume 709, which is the gamut specified by 709 plus 100 nits. That was the standard. But now we have the opportunity to create a much wider volume of colors. The 2020 color gamut, in addition to enormous amount of brightness. That's the promise of high dynamic range. Colors that we have never seen, and that we, we see them in nature, but we have never seen them at home. Anyway, after all this electronic gibberish, if you ask yourself, what is HDR? Well, brighter highlights, much deeper blacks with a lot more details in the shadows, and much richer colors. I'm showing you a simulation of an SDR signal against an HDR signal. You see a more of a three-dimensional representation of the details. The, for example, that balloon is a Japanese balloon. Inside that lamp or that balloon, there is a, it's a, it's a flame, it's a candle. The actual balloon is yellowish in color, but when we see it in SDR, it looks white because that yellowish color is outside the volume of 709. Therefore, we're going to begin seeing a brand new set of colors that we've never seen before. All right, uh, with that preamble, uh, let me also walk you through some of the reasons why HDR now is becoming more real and, more, and creating a lot more interest. Well, first of all, is the introduction of a wide uh, dynamic, very wide dynamic range cameras is becoming very real. Sony introduced about five years ago uh, the very first very wide dynamic range camera for electronic cinematography, the F65 with an AK sensor. This camera is about 15 stops of dynamic range and has been used in a number of very famous movies uh, recently. And uh, uh, not only the F65, but also the F55 has that uh, capability in high dynamic range and colorimetry. And uh, if for feature film production, for over the top or streaming content, as well as for television. These are just cameras that are becoming commonplace in the industry. Also, uh, not only in cinematographic and um, electronic uh, cinematographic production, but also for sports. This is the uh, HTC 4300 a studio camera, which is a 4K, is, has become a de facto camera in high-end production uh, for sports production, and we have it here in the, in, the, in the camera set. This camera also has 15 stops of dynamic range, and which is needed to capture the great differential of brightness between shadows and highlights in a sports uh, application. Uh, grading monitors, monitors capable of presenting uh, high dynamic range pictures. Uh, last year, we introduced the first and uh, most advanced uh, mastering monitor. This is also now a de facto mastering monitor, the X300. It has a very high dynamic range, it's more than 20 stops of dynamic range, and it supports all of the curves that are being proposed for um, production, the s 3, the SMT2084 that I'll be talking about in a minute, and hybrid log gamma, which is another technique. Standards for mastering and delivery of HDR. Okay, the horizontal axis is exposure. About 1,300% exposure is close to 15 stops. This is what the industry can do best at this moment. And the vertical axis is 10 bits. 10 bits will give you 1024 digital code values. And the curves that you see there are the curves that we have in professional production. The tiny, this little, cam this curve here is the traditional 709 gamma 
that was only defined to reach about 100 nips, 100% exposure. The red one is the SEMT2084, also known as PQ, Perceptual Quantizer, which has been used mostly in cinematographic, 4K, Blu-ray, streaming, programming. The green one is a curve that was developed by the BBC and the NHK, Hybrid Log Gamma, in short, HLG, which is developed for live production applications. These two tracks, these two curves, are the technologies that are getting most traction in the industry at this moment. Okay. Therefore, optical to electrical transfer functions, you capture light, you convert them to digits. Electrical to optical, you take digits, you output light in your TV. OETF, EOTF, very simple. Okay. Then uh, these two proposals uh, have been studied, examined along with others by many standardization groups around the world. We have SEMTI, the Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers in the US, uh, ITU, very important, the International Telecommunication Union that determines the, f the shape and standards for production of video worldwide. ARIP is the organization in Japan. Uh, DVB, Digital Video Broadcasting, is the standard organization for Europe. And ATSC is the organization that defines transmission systems for North America. Um, Japan has selected HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma, for television transmission activities in Japan. Uh, and the I uh, DVB and ATSC, we are still debating which technology will be best suited for North America or for Europe. In February of this year, there was a very important event. The ITU, after four years of technical discussions, very deep technical discussion, they created a draft new recommendation. This recommendation is now circulating around the world uh, to be signed by many, many countries, hopefully, and is parameters for high dynamic range for production an international program exchange. This is a big deal. This is a very important document. And it specifies PQ, perceptual quantization, and hybrid log gamma. These are the two curves that now manufacturers, professional manufacturers, we have to pay attention to. Then the curve over there is an absolute curve, is the PQ. Is mostly used for uh, cinematographic applications, episodic, scripted, scripted programming. It requires metadata in, in the production. And it has an incredible range of uh, brightness capability, up to 10,000 nits. And the hybrid log gamma is a relative curve uh, defined to about approximately 2,000 nits, because it's for television and behave like a television signal, can be used in live programming, live production, without the use of metadata. Uh, that's the way the uh, hybrid log gamma looks like, the dotted red line. Okay? You can mix it, you can squeeze it, you can create a special effect. It behaves like a conventional uh, television signal, uh, a gamma signal that we, ha we have today in television, but with a wider dynamic range. And it has a level of backward compatibility. It, if you show it, if the material is shown in a display, a regular a standard dynamic range display, it produces a respectable picture. OK, uh, therefore, now we are getting some direction from the standards group. Uh, let's see what type of uh, production workflows we have in, produ in, in production. Then, as you can see, in production, we have a capture, color grading, editing. Then we have the distribution. We put them into encoders. We send them over satellite, cable, streaming. And then eventually, it gets to the TV set. Well, it goes first to a set-top box. It goes to the TV set. And then we do display mapping. And in each one of these areas, there are different techniques. Some of them are proprietary. Some of them are open. 
Sony knows very, very well the production and acquisition area. This is what, what we do for a living. And uh, we develop a curve primarily for cinematographic applications uh, back in the year 2000, which is the S-Log 3. Well, at, back then it was S-Log, and then it became S-Log 2, and now we are S-Log 3. When the ca this, this curve captures all of the dynamic range of the camera and maps it into 10 bits. If you look at this signal in a normal display, it looks flat. It looks with lack of contrast, milky. But I can assure you, all of the information is in the signal. Once you color grade the signal or apply the inverse curve, you restore the very wide dynamic range. OK, it's very powerful curve. Uh, we're designing this for the future. It can go up to 4,000 nits, uh, or more than 20 stops of dynamic range. Um, we don't have even cameras today can fully push this to the limit. But it's very beautiful for today's technology. And this is what Sony is proposing for a live production as well as cinematographic production. Uh, in addition, uh, our cameras, our studio cameras, and our cinematographic cameras employ a wider range of color than even 2020. It's called s gamut Why? Because we have to capture this very wide uh, gamut of color so that we can trim the signals to fit the, the gamut used in cinema or in 4K or in, in HD. It's a very wide color gamut. It's called S gamut. OK, then there you see, this is a workflow. You capture, we recommend you to capture at the highest possible level of picture quality. If you have the financial resources and the storage capability, be my guest. Record raw, 16 bit. OK? Then you have to do technical grading, you have to do artistic, creative grading, and eventually you make a decision. I have my SDR master, I have my HDR master for distribution. If you're doing a short time processing television programming, you, don't, you cannot wait for a week of color processing. We strong, uh, you have a baseball game, a football game, you need to do real time production. We recommend that you use S-Log3 for a compounding curve and XABC for compression. Then all of the products that you see in the Sony booth employ XABC compression as well as S-Log3 curve. Then, uh, again, we, our recommendation, and we are doing some uh, uh, further discussions of this in the booth and in other areas in the convention, uh, once you create your final product, in your truck or in your studio, you create a mezzanine master. At that point, you are ready for conversion for a distribution HDR master. Therefore, Sony message is we have a production HDR master, and we are agnostic. We support any technology for distribution, whether HLG, PQ, or 4K Blu-rays, or cinematic. Important is to protect the production environment, OK? And we're recommending, if, if, again, the use of RAW, that would be the optimum case, or S-Log3 for, gamma, uh, for wide dynamic range acquisition. All right, uh, I have shown to you that there are now established workflows. And uh, what is happening is that we are getting more and more displays for the home that have the capability for high dynamic range. Uh, about two years ago, Sony was uh, one of the first companies to introduce a very bright and very wide dynamic range displays for the home. We use uh, our marketing name was Extended Dynamic Range Pro. And uh, we have a very special technology. It's called local dimming. OK, what does that mean? The number one headache for television manufacturers is power consumption. Why? Because government regulation prohibit us to have TV sets that consume a lot of power. Therefore, 
we have to be very cognizant and aware of how much power the TV set consumes. Then, in the past, all of the LCD displays, basically we had flat power consumption. We illuminated the panel uniformly. But that produced a washed out, very flat type of display. Now, with the use of uh, extended dynamic range from Sony, we have an algorithm that studies the details of the picture, zone by zone. And we divide the picture in multiple zones, actually <laughs> lots of zones. And we regulate the electricity, the brightness that we are feeding the light sources behind the panel. And if it is a dark area, I dim the panel, I dim the pixel. Then for I start doing local dimming. The more zones I have, the, more, the better I distribute my electricity to achieve higher and higher peaks of brightness. Therefore, some of these peaks can reach 1,200 nits. Sony has shown 4,000 nits of peak brightness in experimental TV sets. And uh, we, at this CES, the Consumer Electronics Show this year, we introduced our latest, uh, most beautiful family of displays, the family of 930D and 940D. The displays that you're seeing in that wall are 940D, 75-inch displays, using this technique. Now, uh, these are commercially available displays. And they, they, are, they look fantastic. But the, we continue to do development. It's more and more R&D. And the key is to create thousands of local dimming zones so that the finer I can specify the light output and modulate the light output per zone, the higher are the peaks that I can produce in my display. Then this is a picture taken from our experimental display technology that achieved 4,000 nits. Then in the near future or later future, we'll be able to bring that technology into the consumer market. All right. Uh, therefore, we have workflows, we have displays, we have professional tools, and now we have begun testing in productions, in live production. Last year, we partnered with the Sky Germany to do a, the coverage of the finals of the football uh, final cup, uh, European Cup in Germany. Um, we had all of our studio cameras recording S-Log3, and we converted S-Log3 to PQ and HLG for transmission. And we were transmitting over satellite, uh, 25 megabits. This is a, a hybrid efficient, uh, high efficiency video coding at 25 megabits. And we have multiple cities with satellite receivers. And we were testing our TV sets uh, to evaluate the quality of PQs and HLGs. Okay. We completed the same process in the finals of the, uh, the MotoGP in the UK uh, during the fall of last year. And um, uh, about Two months ago, we developed a technique that we are also demonstrating here in the, at, at the Sony exhibit. This is a technique to do simultaneous SDR and HDR shading of the cameras. Okay, How can we do that? Well, our HDC 4300 is a very special camera. The basement processing unit has multiple brains, multiple processors. I can output 4K HDR, 4K SDR, HD SDR simultaneously. And we develop a technique for real-time painting of the camera by a single video engineer. Therefore, we don't need to uh, increase the number of personnel in the field, have an SDR truck and an HDR truck. A single video engineer or group of engineers can produce simultaneously SDR productions and HDR productions. Then uh, this is a block diagram of the truck that we had in Hawaii. Uh, and again, we were transmitting live the HDR programming, because this is how you make a living, transmitting HD. But simultaneously, we were creating an HDR byproduct that we were recording 
for transmission. Okay, um, some of you may be saying, well, but uh, Hugo, you are asking me to buy another 4K camera. I just bought an HD camera last year. In the show, we are showing a, an app converter board that can be retrofitted in the higher level HD cameras that Sony sells for broadcasting, the 2000 series uh, cameras. Therefore, this board will enable an HD camera to behave like a 4K HDR signal. It's, it's another way to facilitate the transition from HD to 4K to HDR. All right, and just to conclude, uh, not only live production, but uh, as we have seen recently, the, we are now beginning to see the use of high dynamic range in movies, f uh, full feature films. This is Claudio Miranda, uh, one of the uh, very famous directors of photography in Hollywood. And he shot the movie Tomorrowland using the F-65, totally in high dynamic range. Therefore, um, and there are other uh, programming, like Marco Polo, Mozart in the Jungle, that are also using Sony cameras in high dynamic range mode, OK? The point to remark is, remember, if you can, 16-bit RAW, or S-Log3 acquisition, employ high quality compression algorithms, otherwise you're gonna penalize the content that you're capturing. Uh, and our cameras produce very beautiful pictures because of their very uh, no, low noise characteristics. All right, uh, this is the, I, I would like you to visit. We have a high dynamic range pavilion, which is on my left. And in here we are demonstrating uh, acquisition, workflows for production, and some key products that Sony is already enabling with HDR. All right, then uh, this is the overall message, glass to glass, from the glass of our 4K cameras to the glass of our TV sets. We can maintain the highest picture quality. We are suggesting some recommendations, some guidelines in production by using S-Log3 and RAW uh, as our uh, high-level tools for production. And hybrid log gamma is, is getting a lot of traction in the industry because it facilitates uh, the use of HDR in live production. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be here. And welcome to the HDR Pavilion.